2016, Wrath of the Audits. Uh, Hudson Harris is a JD, MBA, MA, and ESQRSTUV, WX, Y, and Z, who began his IT career in 1997 in network administration, moved on to tech support for Microsoft, and then finally settled into uh, university IT. After leaving the East Coast, Hudson obtained his master's degree in law degree, ultimately opening his own law practice in San Diego in 2010. Hudson just moved back to St. Louis in 2014 to take his current position as a chicken farmer and also privacy officer and associate general counsel for Adaptive America. Uh, he now writes on technology and hippocentered centered issues at uh, LegalLevity.com and uh, at LegalLevity on Twitter, uh, which does not appear to contain even a single list of lawyer jokes. Uh, also, he is apparently barred in California, so please don't let the Twitters know that he's here or we might have to hide him from the police. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jason uh, Hudson on. <laughs> Hi. Um, as uh, the gracious introduction, um, I started in IT about 10 years ago, um, doing grunt work, uh, turning screws, and uh, opening up networks. Um, went on to do my uh, MBA, MA, and JD, and now I work as a privacy officer and general counsel. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about why, why HIPAA matters. Uh, HIPAA, HIPAA was passed in 1996 without really any means of enforcement or funding, and the offices were woefully understaffed. Uh, what we've seen is a real dramatic shift in what we can expect uh, out of the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, uh, coming up in the next few years. The Office of Civil Rights announced that 10% of all covered entities, that's hospitals, doctors, clinics, urgent care centers, uh, insurance companies, are going to be audited this year and 5% of all business associates, which probably applies to a lot more people in this room. That's people who are handling data, data processing, IT. If you're touching PHI, odds are you are either a business associate and have a business associate agreement in place, or you should have a business associate agreement in place to protect you and protect the data that you're handling. So the audits are the first thing that's really going to shift. Um, funding for next year looks to be even bigger. Um, there's a real shift in how the OCR is approaching this, and they've stopped this reactive approach where things are going bad, so they investigate, and they're actively going out and finding people and doing document audits, uh, in-person audits, and even social engineering. Um, the OCR is sending people dressed as bug guys, cable guys, IT guys, plumbing guys, and they're trying to get into offices with flash drives, uh, get to computers that have not been locked down, and they are doing this on a constant basis. There are offices around the country where they are going in and social engineering to get people to mess up. Uh, breaches. Um, how many people got the Anthem letter? Did anybody get the Anthem letter that their information was breached? A lot of hands in the room. Uh, 80 million individuals had their uh, information initially breached through Anthem. Um, in the past six months, that number has gone up to 100 million. Almost one out of three people in the United States have had their PHI breached in the past six months. Um, it's kind of crazy. And as we all know, the more something is in the news, the more likely Congress pays attention to it, the more they fund it, and the more they're going to go after it. Already we're seeing bills come out that are wanting uh, encryption to become something that's standard operating procedure. As many of you may know, Anthem didn't encrypt their data at rest. So once the hackers were in, they got it. Um, the other thing that's starting to change the landscape of HIPAA is enforcement. Um, enforcement traditionally has been fines. Um, there was a cap of $1.5 million uh, for each statutory violation. What is changing is states are getting a little more hardcore about it. California uh, had an incident down in LA where a clinician was fired from their job. IT did not cut off their access. So they got a bottle of wine and some Chinese food and decided to peruse the medical records of the rich and famous in LA. Um, that individual got jail time, six months jail time for viewing the records, not downloading, not sharing, not exposing, just looking at them. Several hundred thousand dollars fine and permanent lifetime disbarment from his medical profession. So they're getting a lot more intense. Uh, we're also seeing personal rights of action, which really hits home. In the trainings I've done, the personal right of action 
usually shocks people because what that means is that if, if you are in control of someone's PHI with a thumb drive or locking down a network or a piece of paper and you lose it, that individual can sue you personally. They'll also go to the company upstairs, but they can sue you as an individual. And that's a sea change. So a lot of states are starting to pass laws that will let them do that. California is one of them, by the way. Um, the, the real cost of HIPAA that we're seeing is not necessarily in the, in the fines, which frankly $1.5 million to a company like Anthem is peanuts. What does cost a lot is the $100 per person for five years of notification and credit monitoring. All told, the 100 million, the 100 million individuals who have had their information breached will cost about a trillion dollars. That's just to monitor their credit for five years and provide notifications to them. So these are real company-ending catastrophic consequences to something that could, at least in theory, be prevented. So here's kind of a quick run through. We're going to talk about a nuts and bolts approach to HIPAA documentation, which is what everybody should have in place. If you haven't seen your HIPAA documentation, you should ask to see it. It matters. What you do and how you do it should be in compliance with what your company's documentation states. Uh, then we're going to do a security risk assessment. Just do a bare bones. This is how to do a security risk assessment. I strongly encourage individuals who have individual departments, individual products, whatever you're doing, you should do one of these to see where you fall. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to talk about HIPAA compliant theories of application development. These are kind of the, the four biggies that we'll, we'll talk about of how to start your programs and your applications from a HIPAA conscious standpoint. So, what is the goal? The goal of all of this is to shift and pivot to a culture of compliance. Um, in too many trainings and too many times I've heard people say, all right, well, we're going to start to ease our people into this and shift our people through this. And honestly, that's a fail move. It has to be a pivot. It can't be a shift. So the culture of compliance is everybody thinking about HIPAA, everybody working to get things going in the same direction. And every single time I've done a HIPAA training, Somebody comes up afterwards, sometimes two or three people are like, hey, I do this one thing where I download everything to a flash drive, then I take it home, then I print it off, and I let my kid color on it, and all these processes that are totally broken that nobody knows are going on to change how people think, to get people to a place that the culture of how you operate is this HIPAA-compliant mentality. And yes, that's Jar Jar Binks catching the elbow to the face. So, episode one, we're going to talk first about the three big categories of documents. The first category are your breach policies. These are how you react in the event of a breach. So, if somebody in your organization says, hey, something hinky just happened, who do they call? What do they say? When do they call? And this document should be in everybody's hands. Everybody in your organization should have a copy of this either in their desk or on their computer to know what to call. The reason this is so important is that there has been a real shift. The state of Texas now has a requirement for 60-minute notification from breach. 60 minutes, not days, not a month, 60 minutes. So all the providers who work through DISHIS, uh, Department of Health and Human Services in Texas, if you get a breach, you have 60 minutes to tell them. And then you have a series of steps after that. So these types of things are critical because when that incident is discovered, is when that clock starts ticking. That, that yes, it's, it is outrageous. And frankly, it's completely unworkable. Um, the truth is, is that they, they, they literally give you an email address. Hey, if you've got a breach, let us know. And then you're supposed to investigate it and do all this stuff and work through it. Yes, Sid. It's a, it's a really good question. I think that's a big part of it. Um, I think that it's, it's part of it is getting the lawyers out of the way, and part of it is getting people that right now you have 60 days under HIPAA, the federal statute, to report a breach. And what's happening is, is companies like Anthem are waiting the full 60 days. I mean, how many people in here could wreak havoc with a person's identity in 60 days? I mean, you can go nuts. I could buy a house in that time frame. So I think what we're seeing is a combination of getting the lawyers out of the way and getting the desire to have people... Uh, notified. The, the, the HIPAA breach that happened with Anthem, it turned out they had 10 million records of an entirely different company called Blue Cross Blue Shield on their servers. 
And then a couple weeks after that, it turns out they had 13 million partial insurance applications also on that same server for their company. So stuff that was just, I mean, everything you needed to open up any type of account, buy a house, do whatever you wanted. Um, breach assessment is something that you would work with to basically look at an incident and see how it filtered down. What happened? When did it happen? What was exposed? What's the risk to the individual? And then you basically come down, the ultimate goal is you come down to make a determination. Was this a breach or was it an incident? And if it's a breach, you kick down to breach notification. That's where you tell the person within a certain amount of time. You've got to offer credit monitoring if there's a severe risk of harm. If there's not, you don't. They have to have a number to contact. There's a whole list of requirements. But all of this has to just be wrote. Because with this Texas policy coming out, it's going to completely change the game. And what we're starting to see is, is Medicare, Centers for Medicaid Services, has now put up the 60-minute requirement for all programs that are using research under Medicare and Medicaid. So it's not just Texas. It's starting to spread. And quite frankly, it's a little terrifying. Um, the next step are the privacy policies. These are kind of the policies for your frontline people. Uh, these are the people who are interacting with patients. These are people that are interacting with clients. Um, how do we safeguard it? Am I walking out of the office with a big uh, paper file that I just kind of hold with me and I open and I read places and then I'll just toss it in the Hardy's trash can? No, it's how do we handle this stuff stem to stern, soup to nuts, life cycle of this PHI so that the people who are using it on a daily basis don't use it in a way that unnecessarily exposes people uh, to risk. The the, the disclosure of PHI is where a lot of the violations come up. If I want you to give my information to somebody, how many times has anybody in this room gotten the, I can't do that because of HIPAA? Yeah. Do, call a doctor's office, say, hey, can you do this? Oh, I can't do that because of HIPAA. Which, frankly, is complete and total bullshit because it's your file. It's your record. What they need is an authorization. They need a consent. They just don't want to because HIPAA is not about Safety, it's about privacy. It's about how does this information get shared with the people who need it. And the, the, the problem is, is that a lot of entities across the country have just decided, well, HIPAA's really hard, let's just lock everything down. And that's the people that lose are, are us, not the big entities. It's the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the patients, it's the users, the, the individual individuals. The other thing that privacy policies cover is how to use PHI, which is becoming a really big issue because of big data. Predictive analytics, how do you take these monumental data sets and figure out what happens when someone does this? What's the most likely cause of a heart attack? This is all information that's kind of at our fingertips, but you've got to do it in a way that's HIPAA compliant. And there's safe harbor provisions to work through for that. The last one is security policies, which is probably the most important for people in this room. This is the info security. So it starts off with workforce management and access. This is hire, fire, uh, how do we suspend? How do we grant access to somebody to get into our system? Do we do background checks? How deep are the background checks that we do? Disaster recovery and business continuity. Big word. It's really just another way of saying that we're going to figure out what happens if our company burned to the ground. How do we keep our clients with their data? How do we give them everything that they need? I mean, it's, it's really, that's where, like, who's gotten the, oh, shit, everything's broken at night call about the server? Everything's stopped. My email doesn't work. The business continuity and disaster recovery should be a document where if that happens, that individual can open up the document, say, I need, to, I need to spin up this server, I need to shift us over, I need to fire up our colo, whatever the case may be, to get things running. The last one is use. Uh, workstation and email. Um, literally, how does someone sit down and type out how they log in? Is it a two-factor authentication like the raffle earlier? Is it a one-factor authentication of just a name? Um, it's that type of, those types of issues and questions are really addressed here. And email, what's appropriate to send in an email? Um, what do you, when do you encrypt an email? When don't you encrypt an email? Um, the, the, the real thing that's important to keep in mind about PHI is that bad people want them. You know, the average full client record costs about $65 to buy online. You can buy bulk, you can buy a thousand at a time, you can buy 10,000 at a time, but there are people out there who do nothing but try and grab this PHI and then sell it. Because you can do a whole lot with it. Um, there's also companies that are being blackmailed. Hey, we got 10,000 records of your clients. If you give us this money, we'll give it back to you. I mean, those types of things are common. And these people can't help themselves. 
So the last step of the documentation is really kind of getting your HIPAA calendar rolling. You should have a 12-month cycle where you've got regular trainings. Uh, trainings need to be whenever there's a big policy shift or a big change or the law changes. Annual is usually a pretty good bet. If you train everybody annually and then get everybody else spun up as they come onto the company, you're probably okay. A lot of states, California, Missouri, Illinois, Texas, have requirements that your people have to be trained in HIPAA within a certain time before they're granted access. Uh, I think Texas is a week. Uh, Illinois is a little bit shorter. So these are states that are passing laws that are more restrictive than HIPAA, that if you don't train this person and they go off half-cocked and give out a bunch of information, you're going to be liable. Uh, persistent alerts, these are also called the NAG emails. Um, you know, sending out, an, uh, sending out a, an alert saying, hey, by the way, we've had five breaches in the past month where somebody didn't type an email address correctly. For the love of all that's good and holy, check the two line. You know, those types of things demonstrate in an audit you're persistently following up with your staff and your, and your, and your IT people and your clinicians. Um, disaster recovery and business continuity, we talked about that, but that's really, you do that on a yearly basis. Do a cold run on a tabletop, then do a warm run where you bring down one, one, one colo and bring up another one. And then lastly is a security risk assessment, which we're gonna talk about next. The security risk assessment should be done whenever you've got a new product, Whenever you open a new department, if you open a new office, any of those things, you should run a, a security risk assessment. Um, the, I kind of want everybody to shift how they think about security risk assessments. And kind of think of this as Dungeons and Dragons Advanced HIPAA Edition. Super fun. You get everybody that matters in your company around the table. HR, legal, exec, and IT. Usually a few people from IT because they know the threats a lot better. And then what you do is create the worst possible case scenario of what could go wrong with our system. Everything you can imagine. You use all of these different items to do what's called a base, to start the baseline of your system. And the baseline of your system it starts with the life cycle of PHI, from birth to death, cradle to grave. The first time a clinician enters it into a computer or writes it down, all the way through when you throw the hard drive onto the shred truck and it disappears. So you need to track everywhere you have PHI. And this is not just like my own theory, this is actually the NIST guidelines for how you should do this. And if you get audited, they will ask you, when was the last time you did a security risk analysis? When was the last time you could, you could actually tell me affirmatively where all of your PHI was stored? That's what the baseline is. The next step is you ID your threats. That's really where the, the, the meat of the tabletop exercise comes in. You've got all of these different ways that someone can mess with your PHI or attack it, and you have the job of literally creating a list, an Excel spreadsheet, and a topic. So you've got two different ways that this works. You've got intentional and unintentional, bad actors and inadvertent actors, and then you've got non-technical and technical. So non-technical threats, fire, flood, and blood. It burned down, it flooded out, riots in the streets, and there's blood everywhere. Um, and then you've also got technical, hacks and attacks. Technical attacks, people coming in trying to steal stuff, people trying to uh, rob your employees of their laptops or walking in and taking laptops. All of those things that you can figure out creates a threat con sheet. Then what you do is you take the threats and you create another column where you do your vulnerabilities. This is the hard part of the exercise because everybody at the table has to say, this is what's wrong with our organization, this is where we're vulnerable. We have a server that's not patched because we can't patch it because our vendor won't let us patch it to work with our billing software. Or we have a procedure that sometimes a random person will just walk in through the office and nobody stopped them. So everybody has to really walk through and say, where could we improve? What are, where are our gaps and our vulnerabilities? Um, look at patches, policies, procedures, software, and equipment. Um, the number one cause of, of technical breaches last year was unpatched software. Unpatched, meaning you could run it, but you don't, or you can't, and you didn't isolate. So you've got a system that you can't patch, but you didn't isolate it from the rest. The next step is to run through your current controls. So okay, we did every, we're doing all of this, we got all these vulnerabilities, what are we doing to lock these down? What are we doing to make these better? And these can be as much as I'm working to 
uh, ensure that every person that walks in the door is, is, is double checked for ID. Or we're using two-factor authentication. Or we're doing a key fob login to a computer. Um, the next step is where it gets a little mathy, but it's important. The likelihood, you take the likelihood of an attack and you say low, medium, or high. And you just assign that. And then you give that the number of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, or 1. Low, medium, and high. Then you go through impact. So let's say this particular vulnerability got hit. How bad would it be? Because there, there's this sense in business that if someone says, well, everything's important. My server's important. Everything on my server's important. Everything has to be the most secure it can possibly be. Well, frankly, that's not true. I mean, who, like HR policies, they're gone. Oh, damn, we've got paper versions. Like, that doesn't really matter. If you lost your client database, well, holy crap, that's, that's company ending. So you really need to like actually look at what's important and what's not important to ensure that it's not just this 100% all the time. Uh, and then you do a magnitude of impact. If we lost this, it would be low, medium, or high. And you give that a number, 10, 50, or 100. And on the next slide, I'll show you guys how this math works. And then you do the risk determination, which is where you plug it all in together. And then it's likelihood times impact equals your risk level. And that creates a nice, pretty little chart that will order all of your vulnerabilities and how at risk they are. Then you know where to spend money. Then you know where the problems really are. And then you know when, when uh, OCR comes in and says, well, how did they get in through this? Well, it had a really, really low risk determination, and we just didn't prioritize it. The, the, the important thing to keep in mind is, is that the OCR, when they come in, they are not these draconian, well, I mean, they are a little bit, but if you've addressed something and you've looked at something and you've really thought about something, that goes a long way towards them going, let's put in a remediation plan as opposed to, well, let's find the crap out of you. Um, the, the hypo client database. So let's say the identified threat is hackers target the system. Fairly basic. Something like the Anthem. We've got an unsecured Windows 2012 server. Say it's not patched completely. Non-hardened firewall, so stock settings, but it's password protected. So we'll give it a likelihood of 0.5 that it's going to be attacked. It's not tremendously high. It's not completely open. It's not web facing, but we'll give it a 0.5. The impact if we lost that would be high. I mean, if we lost all of our client data, it was destroyed or, or disclosed, that would be bad. So that gives us a risk determination of 50. 0.5 times 100 equals 50. And so what you'll do is you'll create this spreadsheet of all of your assets and what that risk determination is. And there are tools out there, we'll talk at the end, to help you put this all together so that you don't have to do all the grunt work. So the next, we'll do one more hypo. And let's say it's a social media site for cat lovers. And I just want everybody to know Mrs. Bigglesworth is very happy. She's loved and she's not at all sick in this picture. This is as intended through genetic breeding. So let's say we've got an unsecured HTTP web server. It's password protected. Un, uh, password protected, but that's the only security from a web-facing uh, idea, web-facing uh, security purpose. So the likelihood of that being hacked is pretty high. The impact would be low. Let's be honest. If you're a cat lover, you've got more than one picture of your cat, and you've probably got them backed up to the iCloud. It's not a huge hit. So the risk determination on something like that would be low. That would mean that it wouldn't really be a humongous impact if that happened. But it's still something that you should address. So once you've gone through all of these and you get your 30 or 40 different vulnerabilities, you do the post-mortem. You have the controlled improvement is the first step. So we've realized that all of this is going on and everything that's happening, how do we make it better? And a lot of times it's as simple as, well, we've got an HTTP server. We need it to be an HTTPS server. We've got to secure it. We need to harden that firewall. We need to add these controls to give us a better sense of security for what's going on. Uh, and then you have your documentation of risk analysis. This is where you button everything up into a nice, pretty little PDF bound package that says, here, OCR, this is everything we did and why we were aware of what was about to happen and why we're not at fault and you shouldn't fine us for anything. And this is the dog tax since I showed a cat. So the last episode, this is HIPAA compliant application development. These are kind of my four big theories of when you're developing a product or you're opening an office or you're uh, rolling out a new app, anything like that, the, the, the concept here is that we work to ingrain privacy at a core 
level, like a really hard level. So the first one of these is privacy by design. This is where everything that you do is automatically clicked over to private. So in Europe, this is really common. In Europe, you have an opt-in option on almost every single email, every single privacy setting, websites, uh, notifications from, from uh, vendors, all of that stuff, you opt in. Who here has opted out of a privacy setting on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Foursquare, Yelp, you name it? I don't want you to tweet where my location is. I don't want you to post that I'm in this place. I don't want any of that information. The, the opt-in, opt-out method is, is that in order to share that, you have to say you want to because the privacy changes constantly. The policies change constantly. The privacy by default means that when you log on to Facebook for the first time, everything's locked down and nobody sees anything. And then you say, I want these people to see it. I want this to be shared. As opposed to, oh my God, here's everything I've ever done. Okay, let's lock it in and try and grab and wrangle in all these pieces of information. Uh, the other one is just taking a proactive stance about this. Too many of the, too many of the security apps out there and too many of the apps do privacy by, uh, privacy by reaction. We realize there's a gap and then we fix it. And it's having people identified in your organization, like a chief privacy officer, a, uh, a, a primary privacy officer, the PPO, the CPO, CIO, that work to find these vulnerabilities first and then close them down. Um, soup to nuts security is kind of what I call a security application to the life cycle of PHI from start to finish. So a soup to nuts application really looks at and follows one piece of PHI or one file from the time it's created through the time it dies. So this seems like a simple idea, but what I usually find are is that there's usually four people involved. You have the person who developed the app or the EMR that you put the information into. You've got the clinician who uses it. You've got the doctor who views it. You've got the IT person who manages it. And then you've got the admin person who shreds it, whether that's digital shred or paper shred. Those five people should really talk. You should really know what's going on with this throughout the entire life cycle. Because there's too many times where you've got this data that's way old. If you don't need it, why are you keeping it? There is no desire to maintain data that you don't have a legal obligation to have or a business reason to have. Because if you've got it under HIPAA, even if you don't have a duty to have it anymore, you have to provide it. So if you've got a seven year, uh, seven year statute of limitations on destroying data and it's year eight and you've got this humongous file on someone and they want it, you have to give it to them. If they become your client again, you have to keep it. So there's a real cost associated with just this policy of let's just hold on to everything for as long as we possibly can. If you really want to keep it, de-identify it and make it something that no one can recognize but you can still use later to do predictive analytics or get data processing on. Uh, five shreds is kind of the way I look at what everybody who has one of, one of these or an iPad or an iPhone that goes out in the field should think about. The, the, the five shreds mentality is basically this. If you have internet, everything's hunky dory. You've got a remote desktop. Nothing is stored locally. Everything's pulled off as soon as you disconnect that session. If it's even on there, you have no problems if that laptop is stolen. Because encryption, while very, very good, is not bulletproof. Most encryption levels can be broken at a certain point. Um, the way that five shreds work is that if you have a clinician who goes out in the field, has 10 appointments, those 10 client records are on their laptop, obviously encrypted. They hit that first client, they type whatever notes they're in or concurrently documenting. When they hit the internet again, that client's ripped off and there's only nine left. So there's only the smallest shred possible on that machine at any given time. Because you know what? If you don't log out of your computer and someone walks up and grabs it, they'll just take it. You know, there's ways that people get into these machines that we just have to start thinking about in a way that says, well, if there's the littlest possible on here, that makes my clients safer. Um, third party tools. I've done a lot of reviews and a lot of working with a, a lot of different tools and I've seen the, the spectrum. I've seen free and I've seen 100 to 200 to $300,000 for HIPAA compliance consulting. So these are people that will come in and say, this is why your program isn't working. And they'll say, well, here's brand new policies, or here, we'll rewrite all of your policies. There are some companies out there that are exceedingly good at what they do. But look out, find what people are doing, and really price it out. Um, there are companies out there now, and this industry is still fledgling, 
that are doing online dashboard management of HIPAA compliance issues. There's a company called HIPAAtrack that does this. All of your policies in one place, all of your alerts in one place, training modules, all of your individuals, everything registered. And when, if OCR comes to audit you, you can hit a print button and it prints everything into one report at the drop of a hat. It's a really cool feature. There's other companies that'll come in and will do uh, third party analysis. They'll do penetration testing, white box, black box. They'll look through all of your policies and say, this is where your gaps are. They will hack your system with a white hat on and say, this is where you need to improve. And those types of things are critical to what we do because internal audits fail. No matter how self, uh, like, no matter how much we want to be honest with ourselves, we will almost always gloss over a few things. A third party analyst will not do that. Um, the company I'm with did one, and we just didn't hear from them for a few months, and then all of a sudden, like, okay, we're ready to talk. And they had been hacking and trying to get poked through our system and find stuff, and had, to, had a box in our rack and was trying to hack from within the system if they had gotten in, and those types of things can be really reasonable. I've seen some around the $1,000 range, I've seen some in the seven to 10,000, and then all the way up into the $100,000 range. Those things are worth their weight in gold because it, it lets you know on a yearly basis, if that's when you're doing it, how vulnerable you are to attack. And when the auditors come, and they are coming, it lets you be ahead of the game. Because if you can just hand them that stack of paper and just say, here, that looks so much better to an auditor. Because all they want to do is run through their checklist. And if you want to see their checklist, it's online. It's the NIST SP800 checklist. And this is one of the most amazing free tools that nobody knows about. It's this 827 question questionnaire. From stem to stern, every single aspect of your security policy in a step-by-step, -step, statute section by statute section. And it says, do you have a policy for this? If not, what do you have in place? What threat level is this? How important is this for you to fix? If you do have it, upload your policy here. This is the tool the auditors are using. This is an inside game book for what they're doing. And as you go through all these questions, and believe me, it is a beast to go through, it gives you a report at the end of it to say this is how compliant you are with documentation, this is where this is, this is where this is, this is what you need to focus on. Bam, and it's zero dollars. Totally free, works on a Mac and a PC, and I think they're working on a Linux version. The other one that's really amazing, yes, it's, it's the NIST uh, HIPAA toolkit. If you hit my website, I've got a, a there's a, a link to it on there. NIST uh, toolkit. Um, HHS, Health and Human Services, also developed, uh, also developed an app for security risk analysis. So that, that big not seven step process we went through, they'll do that all in a really handy dandy app. It's on the iPad and Windows that will let you create a product or an office or a company and then walks you through the security risk analysis, step by step, and then generates a report for you at the end. So these tools are out there, and they're free. These don't cost any money at all. The uh, Office of National Controller of Technology is working with healthit.gov, NIST, and HHS to create these tools and create these um, guides that are completely free to get people ahead of the game. Because at last check, only about 38 to 40 percent of covered entities had an EMR. Everybody else was paper, which is just an absolutely crazy amount of PHI just out there. And the thing is, is that these risks are not, sometimes they're not even stuff that we can account for. There was a breach last year where an individual walked into a doctor's office. He looked down at the, at the secretary. He said, how are you doing? She said, I'm doing great. And then he ripped her desktop completely off of her desk and ran. And that, that one desktop had a fully local client database on it of over a million client records. OCR aside, those people are settling for 1.2 to 1.6 billion dollars right now. These are company ending things. The, the concept of data silos, which is also a part of the, 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 the HIPAA compliant theories of application development, while HIP data silos are really common in this room, does your CEO know about it? Do the people running your company know about it? Because at Anthem, you had one company, had 80 million of their own clients, and on top of that, 
every employee they had had since 2002, name, date of birth, social security number, home address, mother's maiden name, and salary income. Also stored in a client database, unencrypted clear text. There is no reason that ever should have been stored on the same database, much less the same server. And then you add to that the fact they had uh, Blue Cross Blue Shields data on there as well, and then another 13 million records from a, an entirely different situation, and it begs the question, why aren't some of these basic core security concepts really sticking out there? So just, just take away from this that there are really four, really three primary steps that you've got to hit to get yourself to a HIPAA compliant state. Document, document, document. Get these documentation policies in place. There are free policies, there are paid policies. Get them and start to work through them. Because having something is better than nothing. It's a process, it's not just this event you achieve. Also, start to bang out your security risk analysis. The, the, the iPad app is so clean and pretty and easy to use that sometimes I'll get, a task, I'll get a task or a question, hey, what if we did something like this? And I'll just run it through security risk analysis because it's that easy to use. The NIST tool, not very pretty. It's a very bare bones, utilitarian, almost Linux interface with how it looks. Um, and the other thing is to start to think about privacy by design. How do we create that culture of compliance within our organization to really get that privacy in everything we do? Because the people who deal with your PHI and deal with your data on a daily basis are really the ones who can give you a tremendous amount of feedback on how to build privacy in at a ground level. Are there any questions? So everything that happens is a security incident. Not every security incident is a breach. You do the security assessment, uh, the breach assessment, and depending upon the likelihood of harm and what was given out, determines whether or not it's a breach. If it's not a breach, you, may, you log it in the security incident file. If it is a breach, it goes in the breach file. And then you have to report, you can report throughout the year, but you have to report um, at the end of the year by February uh, 14th every year. So it's zero to 500 or 500 and above. Um, if you have one record, then that's, that's a security incident and you still have to log it. Um, if it's uh, 500 or if less than 500, you don't necessarily have to notify the Secretary of Health uh, right away. If it's more, you do. But it's every single one, no matter how little. Um, I dealt with one where uh, someone had switched envelopes. So someone's labs went to someone else and their labs went to the other person. That was technically a security incident. But if you retrieve the records, if you go through the breach assessment work, you can keep it from being a breach by being proactive because you've got those policy steps in place of what you got to do. Yeah. One more time. So he asked how much time you get for the audit, and the answer is it depends. Um, they will do site audits where they'll give you 48 hours notice and then they will come and they will audit a site. If there's social engineering, you get no notice. They will just send people in to try and get into your office. Um, if you get a paper audit, what will usually happen is, is they will say, hello, I'm with OCR and we're going to audit you. You have this much time to put together the documentation. That window, it varies. You don't, you, we don't have control over that. But what I do know is, is that you have to prove it was all there beforehand. So creating documentation is great, but it's putting a Band-Aid on the jugular wound after it's already happened. So it, the truth is it varies. Um, the Anthem audit uh, is still going on. Um, Anthem actually told the OCR that it was not going to cooperate with their auditors until they got the formal court order. So you can also just say no. I wouldn't really recommend that. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, right, those are the four big categories. The security policies, if you go through the NIST tool, it will actually give you a list of what every policy has to address. Those are really the big four categories. Um, at the company I work with, we have 57 distinct policies. Um, I've seen them as much as 70 or 80. Um, breach is usually three, privacy is 12 to 15. Security is a lot more because, you know, you. You have like everything from transmission protocols to encryption to you know workstation use. There's a lot more granular information there. But yeah, those are kind of the four big categories of what you have to have. Yeah. Right. 
Right. So under under HIPAA, for all of the different statutes, there's there's implementation specifications. The implementation specifications are either addressable or required. If they're required, you have to do them. So you have to have transmission protocols so that your data isn't transmitted clear text uh, with no protections. Encryption, oddly enough, is addressable. So addressable doesn't mean you can ignore it. Addressable means you have to write a policy that says why you aren't going to do it. And the irony behind that is, is that in 2009, Anthem had a 700,000 person HIPAA breach for guess what? Unencrypted data at rest. And then six years later, it's the same thing. So when they get audited, they're going to have to demonstrate you don't have to encrypt, but they're going to have to have a tremendous level of documentation to show why they still decided not to, even after they'd already had that vulnerability exposed once. So there's really two, the addressable and required. And the tool points those out. Any other questions? It's not really clear. Um, they haven't laid out the sanctions for that, but in theory it could be anything they could do under DISHES for a violation of HIPAA. And that's one of the weird things about HIPAA is, is that HIPAA doesn't preempt state law. Um, HIPAA allows states, if they're more restrictive, to do more. There is a bipartisan bill uh, in Congress right now to create a national breach standard for HIPAA. Congress doesn't really do much of anything ever at all, so it's not really sure if it's going to go through. But the policies could be fines, they could be penalties, they could be loss of license. I mean, the, the, the expansion of punishments has gotten so crazy that pretty much anything's on the table. Yeah. It's going to be where the client is located generally, but there has been, yeah. There, has been, there have been some issues where if the data is stored in one state, but it's, so like if Kaiser Permanente stores their data in Utah, they could in theory be subject to data restriction laws in both states. Um, it just depends upon where they sue. That's a venue question for the client and how, which laws are more favorable, but they can be held under either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say that again. If you don't hold any data, the, you still are bound by HIPAA in terms of sharing information, disclosing information, talking about a patient in public. But if you have nothing on a person and they have all their data that's theirs, that's their responsibility. That's a big question. Um, I, I, we can talk offline about that. There's a few different, I mean, there's a few different methods, but yeah, let's, let's talk offline. There's a lot of different ways we can skin that cat. Yes? Um, with the exception of California, which gave six months jail time, there hasn't been a whole lot of criminal sanctions. Um, most of the criminal sanctions that are allowed under HIPAA are misdemeanors, which are kind of slaps on the wrist. Um, the hope is, is that the anthem breach will create a much different legal scheme because the IT company they had in 2009 was fired, the new IT company decided to make the same decision, and the CIO was the same across that. So decisions were made that exposed 80 million people's information. And granted, it's all anecdotal, but I know several people who got those Anthem letters who, when they went to file their taxes, had fraudulent tax filings. People trying to open credit card information. So I mean, it's, people are using this data. Anything else? Yes. The big thing that high tech added on was the liability of business associates. Um, so if anybody touches your PHI, almost in any capacity, birth to death. So if you've got somebody who's currying your PHI from one office to another, or somebody who's shredding hard drives or hard files, or you've got a phlebotomist that goes to someone's house that isn't on staff, all of those people are covered under HIPAA as business associates. That was the big thing that high tech added. High tech also added a few things to do with the EMR. Um, but the, the primary shift from 1996 to now has been funding and the additional addition of business associates. Um, what's scary about business associates is that business associate agreements are so uncommon right now for most doctors that the auditing mechanism for that I think is going to tear a lot of people up. 
Because if you've thought about, do I have an agreement with every single person who touches my data or my client's PHI? Most people won't say yes. Because if anybody touches it, you have to have a business associate agreement, stem to stern, that says you're bound by this, I'm bound by this, this is the notification period, and that's where things get really tricky. So you as a covered entity, if you operated in Texas, had a 60-minute notification for breach. If your contract with a business associate said 48 hours or two weeks or a month or whatever, you're going to be liable for breaking that 60-minute because your BA, your business associate, had to follow that as well. Mm -hmm. They're covered, and in fact, just last year, um, we saw the $1.6 million flash drive. Alaska had the dubious honor of being the first state to get a HIPAA violation. Someone uh, had a flash drive that slipped out of their laptop bag. Someone smashed it, grabbed it, and it had 20 or 30,000 client records on it. Um, unencrypted clear text. And then weirdly enough, about six months ago, Alaska was the second state to get fined by OCR for a similar violation. Um, but no, states are liable. They can be held liable. They just aren't usually, because usually they're passing the buck. Right, so if it, it, a lot of these big companies that have been around for years and years and years have created these amazing stores of information. Um, I know of one entity took de-identified data and then predicted what was the most likely cause of a heart attack from that data. By the way, it was loss of housing within 48 hours, which is not something you would ever connect, but was really interesting. So what people are doing is they de-identify this data, and there's two ways to do it. You can get a safe harbor provision where you basically remove everything from name and counter dates, uh, family name, uh, family numbers, family members, sorry, uh, phone numbers. There's a list of 12 or 15 different items that give you safe harbor. And then you can pretty much do whatever you want. Or you can do the IRB method, the internal review board, where you get scientists or statisticians that will sit on a board and say the privacy protocols and practices that this company has in place are sufficient to guarantee that this information is secure. The safest way is the safe harbor. The uh, less safe way but much more useful way is the IRB. Um, if you're going to sell it and it's identifiable or re-identifiable, you have to have authorization. That's one of the requirements of an authorization. From the, from the client. If, if someone's individual is going to have that, their information sold, there has to be an authorization in place. Any other questions? All right, thank you, everybody.